Our next speaker is Professor Terry Tao from UCLA, who will speak on polymath and the, the gaps between primes. Thank you. It's a, it's a great honor to be here and speak uh, on, on the, the gaps between primes. So, of course, it's been, uh, this is the whole focus of this, of this, uh, um, of this day's event. There have been so many uh, talks on this topic already. This talk is going to be a little bit more lighter than the others. Uh, there's uh, not as many technical details. Um, I'm more telling a story about uh, uh, this polymath project that I was involved in. Um, but there'll also be some math in it. So, uh, so I'm going to start pretty much the same way that everyone else starts. Um, so we're looking at the prime numbers, P1, P2, P3, um, and we look at the gaps between consecutive primes, Pi plus 1 minus Pi, and these are all even numbers except for the first gap, which is 1. Um, and of course we have the trim prime conjecture that the, um, the prime gap is, is going to be 2, infinitely often. Um, so we don't know exactly when it was first conjectured. Um, certainly uh, de Polignac, uh, conjectured it. Uh, in fact, he conjectured that P minus this gap is equal to every number, infinitely, uh, every even number, infinitely often, but particularly two. Um, some people attribute it to Euclid, but there's no actual uh, uh, documentation of that. Um, and so uh, we, have a lot, we know a lot of twin primes, but we don't know if they're going forever. The biggest one that's ever been found numerically is, is this beast here. Of, um, but uh, for all we know, that's the last one. Uh, that's, that's almost certainly... Hmm? Huh? Sorry? Well, um, we can't, I, I can't disprove that this is the last one. Okay, this is the, this is the last, largest one that is known. Now, no one believes this is the largest one, but uh, no one can prove it. Uh, no one can prove that's not the case either. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, of course, as we all know now, uh, we have this big, uh, big progress on this conjecture. Um, so back in May of last year, uh, Yitang Zhang, uh, uh, released a preprint, which is now published in the Annals of Mathematics, uh, proving, oh, well, you've, you've all seen the result now, that you can get boundary gaps of size at most 70 million. Okay, and well, all right, and so uh, we've heard a lot about this, this result already. Um, okay, so in fact, uh, he proves a slightly stronger statement. Um, so as, as we've seen in several previous talks, we have the notion of an admissible k-tuple, and a muscle K double is a sequence of uh, integers which are uh, arranged in increasing order, H1 to HK, such that this um, K double avoids a residue class mod P for every P. So, um, so it has to avoid one of the residue classes mod 2, one of the residue classes mod 3, and so forth. So, for example, 0, 2 is admissible. Um, it, avoids, uh, mod, it can avoid uh, uh, a residue class mod P for every P, but 0, 1 is not because you can't avoid a residue class mod 2 uh, with 0, 1. Uh, similarly, 0, 2, 6 is admissible, but 0, 2, 4 is not because you can't avoid a residue class mod 3 in 0, 2, 4. Okay, um, and you can construct an admissible k double. The simplest construction is you to take, take the first k primes larger than k, uh, and you can check that that's automatically an admissible k double. So there's lots and lots of these admissible k doubles. Um, there is the um, prime tuples conjecture, which we've already seen in several talks. Um, so back in 1923, Hardy and Littlewood generalized the twin prime conjecture to make the following statement, that whenever you have an admissible k double H1 to HK, then you should be able to shift it uh, so that you can make all the numbers in the, sh in the shifted uh, tuple prime, um, and you should be able to do it infinitely often. So there should be infinitely many shifts n, such that when you take n plus H1 and up to n plus HK, you get, you get uh, more prime numbers. And you need admissibility. If you're not admissible, then you can, there's, there's only finitely many of these shifts that, that can do this. Okay, so this conjecture is still open, uh, except for k equals 1, which is trivial. Well, it's Euclid. Um, but, uh, okay, but what Zhang showed was a, the following weak version of this conjecture. So uh, let k be big enough, and uh, Zhang's uh, big enough was 3.5 million. Uh, then any tuple of length 3.5 million, you can find a shift, or you can find infinitely many shifts, um, where maybe not all of these shifts are prime. That would be the prime tuples conjecture, but you can get at least two of the uh, shift's prime, and that gives you bounded gaps. Okay? And in fact, the, the, bound, the, length, the, the bound on the gap is the, uh, is the diameter of your, of your tuple. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, so Zhang got uh, this k was 3.5 million, uh, and then you just let uh, the, the tuple you pick is, is sort of the, the, the simplest one, which is the, the first k primes larger than k, 
uh, and you just check that the diameter of this k tuple is bounded by 70 million, and that is uh, that is how he got this 70 million bound. And this is in fact the exact uh, argument in his paper. So five lines of argument in in, in Zhang's paper gives you uh, the bound of 70 million once you once you know this uh, this this weak density uh, this weak highly little prime tuples conjecture. Okay. So uh, already in Zhang's paper, uh, he writes that this is not optimal. Yeah, so um, in his paper, Zhang writes, let me quote, uh, this result is of course not optimal. The condition that K is bigger than 3.5 million is also crude, and there are certain ways to relax it. Uh, to replace the, uh, well, the value of K by a value as small as possible, uh, sorry, uh, the value of the 70 million by a value as small as possible is an open problem that will not be discussed in this paper. Uh, so he didn't discuss it, uh, but uh, this open problem turned out to be very tempting. Um, so, uh, so this was uh, May 14th, 2013, is when this paper came out. <clears throat> so very shortly afterwards, um, all over the internet, uh, people started uh, chipping away at this. So I think the, the first record we, we can find is a comment about a week later, saying that, well, if you just actually uh, plug in the, uh, his calculation to Wolfram Alpha, you can actually get the 70 million down to 63 million uh, with a, you know, one, minute, one minute's worth of effort. Um, then on the archive a few days later, uh, Tim Trudian uh, managed to, to, to squeeze uh, to be slightly less than 60 million. Um, and then a day after that, uh, Scott Morrison said he couldn't resist, that uh, if, you, if you optimized uh, Tim's argument just a little bit more, he could get actually 59.4 million. Uh, that was May 30th. Um, so then I, I got interested. I posted on my own Google Plus account that actually I think I can get 58 million. Um, Okay, I, I, I thought that uh, I was done then. I was going to say that, uh, okay, I'll leave, it, I'll leave it to someone else to jump in to, to do better. Um, okay, um, okay, then Scott responded to a comment that I made on, left on his blog, and he's, okay, and then I said, oh, with a few more tricks, I can, I can get down to 57 million. Um, and then, uh, okay, and then we started uh, optimizing other parts of Zhang's paper. Um, there was lots of other numbers and parameters that, that you, we could, we could uh, you could parameterize, and uh, okay, if, if you, if you uh, so we started doing that, and, and Scott, the uh, day afterwards, and she get down to 58 million, hooray, we're below 50 million. Um, okay, and then, yeah, okay, so, uh, by this point, he had started a lot of computer programming running in parallel to, to, to optimize for all kinds of other parameters. So he, his K has got down from 3.5 million to 2.9, and then you could get to 42 million. Okay, um, yeah. Then we started getting um, better and better bounds. So there, was a, there was a, a big gain at some point. There was a truncation argument in Zhang's paper that we managed to, to improve quite a bit. And we got K down to about uh, 800 million. The prime gap became 13 million. Um, okay, and then, and then 4.9 million and so forth. And so, okay, you can see, so the, the, these are all comments on, on uh, Scott's blog post. You can see there's, there's already 50 comments uh, on this one blog post um, by, by this point. This is like only after like three or four days. So at this point, it was sort of clear that, the, that this, there was a lot of and uh, there was a lot, lot of interest in this, and, and we wanted to organize this systematically. So fortunately, we already had a framework for doing this. Um, we had um, in the past these uh, online math projects called polymath projects, where um, uh, started by Tim Gowers, uh, in which you take a single math problem and you you t rather than solve it privately by one or two people. Uh, working uh, 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 sort of out of the uh, public view, you, we we uh, we have uh, these projects where uh, everything is run online, is, is open, every single step is is is, is for the public to see. The, um, the so the philosophy of polymath is that um, so traditional research is based on one or two people making you know working for a long time and making really big steps, big breakthroughs at, at some key point. Um, and Tim was asking whether it was possible to also prove non-trivial math theorems. Um, not by taking big steps of, um, uh, by individual people, but if you have a lot of people each making a small contribution. Um, so, of course, some theorems, you know, some, some really deep results will probably not be um, attainable by this way, but some, a, a certain subclass of math problems should be amenable to sort of at least incremental crowdsourced type approach. And so, um, so back in, I think, in 90s, uh, when was the first one? 98, 99? Um, no, 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 no. 2007, I think, was the, was the first one. Um, yeah, so, so Tim Gowers started one in, in Common Shorex, which was very successful. This was called Polymath 1, and then we started many other projects, Polymath 2, 3, 4. Some worked, some didn't. Um, so not, you know, sometimes even if you throw a lot of people at a problem, it doesn't actually get solved. Um, 
So I think yeah, maybe yeah, I think two or three of, the, of, of them were quite successful, and the, uh, the others sort of got, got stuck at some point and, and uh, fizzled out. Uh, but we, but uh, so this one was the eighth one, and so we uh, on, on June fourth, um, I, I posted on the Polymath blog a proposal for uh, to um, uh, to sort of systematically improve this balance. So we had two goals. Um, the first one, and sort of the most sort of easy to, uh, uh, to convey to other people is to just improve, keep improving this balance 70 million. So it was already down to 4.8 million, I think, at the time of, of this proposal. And just to get that down as, as, as fast as, as much as we could, uh, but also to, to try to understand, not, not just to numerically optimize the argument, which uh, is sort of a fun sport, but sort of it doesn't really lead to much more conceptual understanding. Uh, we also wanted to really understand Zhang's argument better to see how it related to all the other literature uh, to, to, to find simplifications and uh, just to clarify uh, the argument as much as possible and hopefully to find um, uh, substitute arguments that are more efficient or, or more conceptually clear. So we proposed this and very quickly uh, you know, there was a lot of support for this so we, we started it right away. Um, and um, one thing about this project was that it split into a lot of groups um, and so um, we, we set up a lot of posts on different blogs to organize different parts of, of this project. Um, so for instance, um, I set up on my own blog uh, what we call an online reading seminar um, for Zhang's paper. So this is this 56-page paper, um, which had a lot of fairly deep mathematics in it. You know, so ranging from this, you know, using these exponential sum estimates to, to the SIF theory methods. And initially, uh, we were not so expert in all of these, these, these techniques. Um, so uh, we started a reading seminar where we would each read different parts of the paper and make comments, ask questions, you know, just like a regular reading seminar, but just held online. Um, and so this was, the, uh, this was the, um, the blog post that I set up. And so people started commenting on this right away. Um, and then elsewhere, um, yeah, so for poly we have a polymath wiki, um, so run on the same software as Wikipedia, uh, a lot smaller though. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we, we started a web page to re record all the information about uh, that, you know, so uh, like all the world records, the, the, the smallest bounds we can have, all the uh, discussion, all the links to papers, and, um, and, and so on and so forth. So we started a, um, a wiki page. Um, uh, we, uh, the way polymath projects usually work is that in, in addition to the wiki page, which is where we store sort of all the um, data and links and re world records and so forth, um, most of the research happens on blog posts, which we call threads, and um, uh, these are often held on, on you know, sort of different blogs, maybe will host a, a different thread. So the, the very first uh, blog post was by Scott Morrison, and then um, I wrote a few, and, and, and Scott and, and Andrew Sutherland wrote a few more. And, uh, eventually it was mostly on my blog, actually. Um, and so each of these blog posts uh, would run, we, we'd have comments for, which would go on for several weeks until Maybe they hit about maybe 100 or so comments, at which point it became quite hard to follow the thread. So what we do normally is that when the thread gets too long, we, we stop it and we start a new blog post summarizing the previous progress and trying to, to, uh, to sort of direct things in a more profitable direction. So sometimes some of the directions we pursue don't, don't, don't pan out. So you have to keep sort of rolling over the thread every time uh, it's, uh, the discussion gets a little, a little bit stale. So it ended up with, uh, I think, uh, yeah, we even had, I think, uh, the first polymath project it was about uh, yeah, 17 threads. Okay. So um, yeah, so th this project turned out to be, to be very modular. We, we saw in, um, in um, uh, James Maynard's talk there was this diagram of different components that go into Zhang's argument, which is which is very um, which is very good for a polymath project to have these different um, components because um, not everyone is an expert in all the areas of mathematics needed to work on all the projects components separately. So you can have some groups work on, on one part, some groups work on the other part. And it, they, they all combine to give this this bound on, 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 um, on, gaps, on uh, the gap machine price, which we call H. So you know, if, if one group manages to, to improve their, their, their part of, of, of the project, then H goes down. If someone else makes an improvement, then H goes down as well. And so it, it, was, a, it was a nice sort of collaboration. So for example, um, one, uh, one, uh, one group, which was on the, the first to get started, was um, sort of the combinatorial side of the project, um, which was one of the boxes actually that uh, was in uh, James's diagram, where you, you start with a single value of k, like 3.5 million, and you can ask what is the smallest, what is the narrowest k-tuple that, that you can find there, of, which is still admissible. So the admissibility is a combinatorial um, condition. You have to avoid certain residue classes. And, and how many 
uh, what's the narrowest you can make a, a tuple of a certain size. And so, um, all right, so this, this is quite a computational task primarily. And so um, you know, people mostly from computa uh, with a more uh, computational number theory view, um, perspective uh, started weighing in on this. Um, in particular, Andrew Sutherland actually became sort of the, uh, the, the, the master of this eventually. Um, so the problem of finding now, now admissible tuples, you, it, it's equivalent to the following question. Um, you take an interval, you, you, it's, it's, a, it's a sieving problem. Uh, you take an interval of, in, of integers, say um, n plus one up to n plus m. You take a solid interval of integers, and you knock out one residue class mod p for every p. Like maybe you knock out one mod two, and then maybe zero mod three, two mod five, and so on. For each prime p, you knock out one residue class mod p. Uh, if, you, if you knock out one residue class mod p for every, um, uh, for every p, what's left is, is automatically admissible by definition. And um, saying, asking for the narrowest admissible tuple for, for a given um, length is equivalent to asking for the um, largest tuple that you can fit inside a given interval. So what you can do is you can, you can fix the interval, like say interval of 70 million or 60 million or whatever bound you want. You ask what's the biggest um, admissible tuple you can find inside this interval, which is the same as saying that if you, uh, uh, what is the most efficient way to sieve out one residue class mod, mod p for every p so that you get the most number of survivors. You want to get the, sort of the biggest sifted set possible. Um, so this turns out actually to be a, a, a well-studied problem, um, the ma maximizing um, the size of a sifted set. Uh, it's, it's in fact closely related to this um, old conjecture, Hardy and Littlewood, which is actually one of the few conjectures they made which we now believe to be false. Um, so um, one of the Hardy Littlewood conjectures is that if you take the number of primes up to x plus y, and the number of primes up to x and the number of primes up to y, that you should always get this inequality. The number of primes up to x plus y should be bounded by primes up to x plus primes up to y. This is usually true, uh, and in fact, we, we have no actual um, counterexample to this inequality uh, with any fixed finite x and y, uh, explicit x and y. But we now believe that this inequality is false. And in fact, the, the amusing thing is that the, the other highly little conjecture uh, implies that this one's false. Um, so, so a self-defeating uh, uh, um, uh, pair of conjectures. Um, but uh, the, the, um, this was, um, so um, that was shown by, by Hensley and Richards uh, uh, using an example of a, of a, a sifted set that was extremely large. Um, so, um, so this is a combinatorial problem. How, how can you sieve um, an interval to get um, a sifted set as large as possible? And so there's various strategies you can use. So, that, you know, so this, this standard one is like you can just take a, a random set of, 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 of um, residue classes. You can try a greedy algorithm. Like at, at for each p, you try to only pick the, uh, um, the one that, 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 uh, that removes as few elements as possible. Um, there's the, the classical super autosthenes, where you just remove zero mod p for every p. The mops are two, mops are three, mops are five, and so forth. Um, Hinson and Richard had the idea of shifting your interval. So rather than sieve the numbers from, say, one to n, shift it, from, uh, shift it to minus n over two to n over two. And the, the reason being that um, the, um, uh, there, there are more primes near, the, um, near zero than there are away from zero. Primes are a little bit denser. Uh, near, the, near the origin, and the, uh, the, auto the aerotosting system becomes a little bit more efficient um, if you do that. In fact, that's, what, that's, that's how they disprove this conjecture. Uh, I think Eric just changed the conjecture as soon as he saw the disproof. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. Well, you, you can salvage it. I think, I think like, if you put a two here, uh, that's like your theorem um, a bit, uh, of Montgomery and Vaughan. But uh, um, yeah, there's, there's various ways to salvage this. Um, yeah. Shinso made the observation that you, you take Eratosthenes 0 mod p, but if you, change zero, uh, if you don't sieve 0 mod 2, you sieve 1 mod 2, uh, you actually save a little bit. Uh, uh, you, I mean, you, you lose some, but you, you lose something, you gain something, and it, actually, it bounces just barely in, in one's favor. Um, so there's, there's, there's lots of different strategies you, um, you can find. So a lot of the early progress was just basically plugging in each of the known strategies uh, to get uh, um, and doing numerical search, optimizing parameters, and so forth to, um, um, to get improvements. Um, there's also a, um, a lower bound. Yeah, so uh, all, all these techniques, if you want to find an admissible tuple of size k, all these techniques give you a tuple of size k log k, roughly. Um, all these different strategies, they, they change a lower order term, but the, the leading term k log k is unchanged. Um, there's also a lower bound coming from the large sieve, which we've already mentioned in other talks, which is a, there's a lower bound of half k log k uh, coming from there. So there's a, there's a gap of two, factor two, between the lower and upper bounds, which unfortunately there seems to be no chance with current technology to narrow very much. 
Um, so KLLK is about the best you can do. Uh, you, um, so that, um, but you could, you could hope to save a little bit with improved sieving. Uh, so eventually the sieves got quite, quite, um, quite sophisticated. Um, that, uh, you know, you, um, eventually what happens is we, 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 take, we take one of these sieves and then we look and, and then you combine them with things like uh, local optimizations. You, you, you sort of take out one residue class and you, you replace it with another and you, you, um, you try to, to do local adjustments to try to save one or two elements, one or two more survivors than you did before. And you keep sort of op doing these local moves. Um, sort of amusingly, at, at, at some point, um, genetic algorithms were, were introduced. So we started breeding good examples of tuples, and, and then you, you sort of genetically combine pairs of them together to get slightly better ones. Um, so the, that actually got quite sophisticated. Although um, this eventually became sort of obsolete because uh, the other groups were reducing K so fast that um, so th these techniques were good when K was like a million or, or 100,000. When K was like 1,000 and so forth, um, you didn't need these, these tricks anymore. But still, these were quite, uh, quite clever strategies. Um, in fact, uh, we, so um, Andrew Sutherland and uh, some other people became very systematic at this. In fact, they even set up a web page um, where um, you, you could, uh, the web page was sort of a, a robot that would automatically accept admissible tuples. And so for every value of K, uh, it, would, it would store the world record for what is the narrowest tuple of size K. So for example, the narrowest tuple of size 4,000 is, uh, is the best that we know of is 36,610. And that was one of Andrew's K tuples, and that's submitted to, to this page. And so, and so the uh, the computational number theory started sort of this competition of who could who could fire up the computers faster and do more efficient programming to, to get clean various world records like this. Okay, um, but uh, for small K, like K below 342, uh, in fact, we actually have optimal results. Uh, uh, not only do we have these examples of narrow tuples, um, they're confirmed to be optimal by some integer programming techniques. Okay, and now K, by the way, nowadays is about like 50 or so. So actually, this, this, tab this, this table is no longer so sort of directly relevant for, for uh, the, the world records, but for a while, this, this was sort of where uh, all the best records came from. Okay, so that was one part of the Polymath project. Um, another part was the sieve theory part. Um, so uh, basically looking at, at the GPY sieve and various modifications, including Zhang's modification. Uh, so I started a separate blog post where we would analyze um, the GPY sieve and Zhang's modifications and see how we could, um, well, first to understand it, and then whether we could improve various aspects um, of the sieve. Um, so uh, the sieve has been explained now three or four times already today, so I'll add one more explanation. It's, it's, it's the same thing. Um, yeah, so uh, the way I view it is, uh, and the way that I think James also views it, is, is that uh, is the, the, the modern GPY sieve is an application of the original principle. And uh, what you want to do is that you want to find, say, two or more primes inside a tuple, n plus k1 up to n plus k uh, n k. Um, and um, you can view this in terms of weights, um, but I like to view it in, in more probabilistic notation, which is an equivalent formulation. Um, so a weight, uh, which, I, which I call nu of n, is that some non-negative function on the integers. Uh, every time you have a weight, um, you can use it to define a, a, a probability distribution on the integers. You, you take the weight, uh, you normalize it so that it's, it sums to one, and then every time you have some non-negative numbers that sum to one, that gives you a prob probability distribution on the integers. So every weight is giving you um, a, ran a way to select random integers. And generally, you, you want to select um, your weight so that um, uh, when you take, take your random number n, n plus h1 up to n plus hk, you want to hope that these numbers are prime, or at worst, almost prime. So you, you, uh, you, you, you select some cleverly chosen um, random distribution, and uh, you, the purpose of this random variable is, is, is uh, you, want to, you want to choose this random variable so that um, if you shift by h1, shift by h2 up to hk, all of these numbers should have a high probability of being prime. Okay, so that if, 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 for example, n plus h1 is prime more than 50% of the time, and n plus hk is prime more than 50% of the time, then just from the original principle, they will both be prime with positive prob probability, and that will give you a bounded gap. And more generally, if you can get the sum of all the probabilities um, to be bigger than 1, if you can, so if this number can be pushed above 1, then you automatically get, um, uh, from the original principle, um, uh, some n where, where two guys are prime. If you can push this above 2, you can get 3 primes and so forth, as you saw in James's talk. So this is the basic strategy, and the, the, the difficult part is to actually um, choose this weight. Well, okay, two, two parts. One is to choose the weight, new, and then one is to, is to actually prove that the weight obeys this, 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 this inequality. Okay, 
Um, oops. Right. And so, as we've seen in many other talks, this is this is a good uh, this is a problem in Civ theory. Okay. So um, and people and as we saw in in um, in, in Dan Goldson's talk, there was uh, there were many many. Uh, sieves considered, uh, but eventually uh, uh, the sieves converge on, 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 on a Silberg type sieve. So a good choice of, of, of sieve weight is, is uh, some divisor sum, where you, you sum over all divisors of the product of n plus h1, n plus h2, n plus hk. You sieve up to some level r, you pick some well-chosen coefficients, and you can choose what coefficients you want to put in here. And then you square it. Uh, sometimes you can put a normalization factor in front, but that doesn't really matter so much because it cancels itself out in the end. Okay, and so you get to choose the sieve level R, and you get to choose these coefficients. So, um, so this is eventually what so the GPY sieve uh, method um, ended up as. Um, so this is again the uh, the sieve. So, um, all right. So uh, you plug in the sieve, and then you want to start computing the probability that n plus h1, n plus h2, these numbers are prime. And uh, if you expand things out, you switch summations and so forth. Uh, pretty soon you find that uh, you need to understand what primes are doing in arithmetic progressions. You need to understand um, how good the error term is in the prime number theorem in arithmetic progressions of a certain spacing, and the spacing of the progressions you need depends on this level r. So if, you, if, your, if your d is less than r and you square this, it turns out that the, um, the progressions that you need to understand are of, of size about up to r squared or less. Okay? Um, and so roughly speaking, um, as long as you understand how many prime primes there are in progressions up to the R squared, um, then, you can, then you can count uh, these, these probabilities. Um, you don't need to count all the progressions up to R squared, but uh, you need to count them on the average. If you can count most progressions up to R squared, then you can, you can compute these numbers. And I mean, the, the formulas are complicated, but there's some explicit formula. Okay, so, um, all right, so, it's, um, so you would like um, to have as strong a distribution estimate as possible because that, that makes R bigger. And, uh, then you can, and the bigger R is, the more flexibility you have in the sieve, and the bigger that you can make this, uh, this probability. Okay, so the standard distribution estimate that, uh, that you can use is the, uh, the bombier vinogradov theorem, which we've now seen many times today. Um, and roughly speaking, what that does is that, uh, that it, it gives you control on primes in arithmetic progressions up to level about x to the one-half. If you're, the prime's up to x in progressions of spacing up to about root x, uh, you can get a, a theorem, which means that you can take R up to about x to the one quarter. Um, and Zhang's great achievement was, um, was after a lot of work, uh, was that you could, you could push the x to the one half here up to a little bit. In fact, what he got was x to the one half plus uh, 1 over 584, uh, uh, with some caveats. So the bombier vinogradov theorem can handle every single um, ethnic progression in every modulus on the average. Um, Zhang had to cut out some of these, these, these progressions. The spacing had to be square-free. You couldn't have large prime factors, um, and, the, the, and the, uh, the, the, um, the residue class also had to be somewhat restricted. But uh, the restrictions that he imposed were sort of ex almost exactly what... Uh, um, well, he was able to, uh, even with the restricted estimate, he was still able to construct a slight truncation of this Selberg sieve, which was still sufficient for the bounding gaps application. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that... Um, there was some earlier work of Motohashi and Pince, who had also observed that, if you, that it is possible to truncate um, the sieve uh, in such a way that you only need to, to, to control uh, progressions in smooth moduli. Um, but uh, they were not able to actually prove a, um, a new estimate in smooth moduli, but they, they did make the observation that that would, that would suffice. Uh, the, 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 the precise distribution estimate that they have is slightly different from Zhang's, but, but fairly similar. Okay. <clears throat> So that's, that's the gpy shang sieve method in a uh, nutshell, R. Um, yeah, so here again is the sieve. Um, but of course, you still have to choose these, these coefficients. Um, and so there was a, uh, yeah, and, and that's, that's part, part of the art is actually finding the right choice of coefficients uh, to plug in. Um, so as we saw in Dan Goldson's talk, uh, after a lot of, uh, of iterations, uh, the, uh, the, the sieve weights that they actually settled on turns out to be um, a good choice, uh, it turns out to be the, um, the Mobius function times a certain power of a logarithm uh, with this extra power parameter L that you can, you can play with if you want. Um, so this, this is what uh, Gosen, Pins, and Yodum used. Uh, they also mentioned as, um, in that you could generalize this, you could replace this by more general polynomials of log R already if you wanted. Um, Zhang basically used the same weights as, as the original paper Gosen, Pins, and Yodum, except that there, there were some truncations. You, you didn't work with all D, you worked with, with smooth D, 
be, um, because that was the limitation coming from the distributional estimate. But Zhang showed that the effect of truncation was, um, was fairly small if k was big enough. Okay. Um, now you can do a bet. You can do better if rather than, than take a pure power of log, which is um, so. This, this in fact was already observed in the original paper of, of, of GPY um, uh, for small k at least. That if, you, if you, rather than take a, a, a pure power of log, which is fairly easy to compute with, but you could um, instead take a more general um, polynomial or, or even a continuous function or smooth function of log d, or maybe log d or log r, if, depending on your, on your normalization, and. So you can plug in a more arbitrary weight here, and then you, you, you compute your probabilities, and you find that um, you have to optimize a certain variational ratio between two integrals. And it turns out that uh, this be, being one-dimensional, you can actually solve it explicitly. There's a, there's a collapses to this uh, ODE, which you can solve using Bessel functions. And so there's actually an optimal F that you can compute, and it was actually done uh, by Connery, um, unpublished, and then later exp um, in a published work of Farkas, Spence, and Rivesh. So uh, that already actually saves you quite a lot. So the, 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 the K, which was 3.5 million, if you use Bessel functions, it can get down to like, like, um, like 30,000, I think, if you, if you just do that. Um, another improvement that, uh, that came into the Polymath project, I mean, so one of the great things about Polymath is that um, you know, if it's just one or two people working, you know, you're sort of limited by the toolbox that the one or two people know. But you know, we, we had dozens of people working. And everyone knew a separate sort of, a separate, had a separate box of tricks. And so we had all these lovely contributions from different people, which, and, which we wouldn't have got if it was just one or two people working. Um, so um, Janusz Pintz, for example, uh, contributed uh, and observed that, uh, that there was a truncation argument which, um, which used, was used in Zhang's paper to um, do all the restriction to smooth modular. And um, the error term uh, was... Uh, it, it decayed in K, so if K was big enough, the error term was negligible, but it decayed fairly slowly. And one of the reasons why this K was so big, 3.5 million, was because um, the, uh, that was what you needed to go, get to before the truncation effect was, was minimal. Um, Pins found a, Janus found a much better way, to uh, much more efficient way to control the, 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 the truncations. He, he sent some handwritten notes, actually, you know, um, to, uh, which we uh, incorporated into our project. Um, to pretty much, uh, which pretty much eliminated the effect of truncation completely. Um, so that was a, that was a nice, um, nice simplification. And so um, because of that, just from that alone, we were able to reduce the, the gap between primes down to about 56,000. So for example, here, just to, to show you some of the, uh, um, the way things work. So um, I think here at some point, um, uh, one of our contributors, so actually we, we have one key contributor who remained anonymous. Uh, he, he used a pseudonym. For the, uh, for the throughout the entire project, never gave his name. Um, that's fine. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so he worked through the, 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 these, the, these pins calculations, and he said that the, the k can get down to to fifty nine uh, hundred or so. Uh, and then pretty much immediately afterwards, on, on one of the other blogs that was where the project was running, Andrew said, "Okay, we've we've um, um, uh, the um, V O eight L two L T U, which is uh, this uh, anonymous collaborator, got uh, got this new k, and then he he plugged it in into uh, into his now very efficient machine for, for creating um, admissible tuples, he said, oh, I can get 56,000 uh, from this. And I think I was sort of like hours after, after this. You know, so there was this sort of assembly line sort of uh, at some point um, uh, with this. Okay. Um, all right, so we had one group working on the combinatorial side of, of, um, of, of uh, Zhang's paper, getting the tuples narrow. There was one working on the sieve theory side. Um, and then uh, the final group uh, was actually trying to improve the level of distribution. So Zhang has got a level of distribution estimate uh, above the bombier vinaigrative limit of x one half. He managed to get x one half plus about one over five hundred. Um, and so we tried to in improve that. Um, so this 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 group took a lot longer to get started because uh, we actually had to read most of Zhang's paper uh, before, and it's it's quite deep. Uh, many of the te techniques involved there, and um, um, it's based on earlier work of uh, Fubri and Ivanich and Bombier, Friedland and Ivanich, and most of us initially were not so familiar with with those methods. So we had this this reading seminar, as I mentioned before, where we were we were reading, and we got a lot of, of useful contributions from many people. So, for example, Ben Green, uh, who ended up not being a formal contributor to the whole Polymath project, but he was also independently interested in, in, in Zhang's paper. So, so he very kindly um, actually read through all of Zhang's paper and made commentary on section by section, which was very, very useful. 
so, so here, for example, he, he, this is sort of the start of a very long blog post, of a, a very long comment on him, commenting on section 14, for instance, um, and giving sort of a, a, a character sketch of how this argument works. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, so after a few weeks, we had actually uh, digested this work and we started improving um, um, Zhang's results. So, so how, does, how did Zhang get his uh, distribution estimates? So of course, we, we saw Zhang talk about this already. Um, yeah, so there's this, um, it uses many ideas which are actually uh, now fairly standard in, in the literature, uh, but done very, very efficiently. So um, the first thing is that you decompose the primes into, 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 into sort of nice factorable pieces. So there's all these identities involving the primes. Actually, for technical reasons, you don't actually use the primes themselves. You use something called the von Mangold function, which is very much like the primes. It's sort of a proxy for the primes. So you have this von Mangold function, which is capturing primes, and we have all these now fairly standard ways of splitting um, this von Mangold function efficiently into, um, into well-factored well pieces. So things like convolutions, Dirichlet convolutions are maybe two factors, alpha can both beta, or maybe three factors, or four or five. And so there's, there's, there's some commentarial calculus uh, for how you can, you can decompose. Uh, there's a number of identities out there uh, that you can use. Um, I think the two most popular ones are, are the Vaughan identity and the uh, heath brown identity. Um, Zhang used, used the heath brown identity. Um, we searched very hard to see if there's any better identity um, that would be more efficient than this one, but actually we discovered that this was essentially optimal, um, which apparently is folklore but not actually published anywhere, uh, that, that, um, that any other identity to decompose the von Mangold function must basically uh, use at least as many terms as the ones that appear in the heath brown identity. So you can't really do better than using heath brown. So uh, use this identity, which I, I won't write down here, but it, um, it decomposes um, the, um, the problem to that of contro controlling um, how Dirichlet convolutions of two or three functions behave in ethnic progressions. And um, so this gives you some fairly complicated sums. And so what you do is that you, you then apply more standard techniques, uh, Cauchy-Schwartz, um, something called the, the Linux dispersion method, um, Fourier analysis, or Poisson summation, you, you expand things out. Um, the sums become messier and messier, uh, but there's, there is a method to this. Okay, you, um, um, you, you, the, the, these sums contain some factors that you don't like, um, and some factors that you do like. And, you, and the, um, the idea of using things like Cauchy-Schwartz is to get rid of the, the terms you don't like and, at the, at, and, and only have the terms that you, you, you do understand how to control. But every time you do that, unfortunately, the sums get a bit longer and longer. Um, and eventually, after basically a lot of Cauchy-Schwartz, and some Fourier analysis, uh, you end up with, you have to understand short exponential sums. You have to understand like the sum for all numbers up to n of some of ex exponentials e to the 2 pi i times, times various um, rational functions. Um, and then, um, and it turns out that you just need to control a bunch of exponential sums, and there's two types of exponential sums that come up. Um, so one of them at least are one-dimensional exponential sums, where you just sum over one parameter. And here you can use the, uh, um, the classical um, um, estimates of a on v, uh, the Ray exponential sum estimates uh, coming from the Riemann hypothesis on curves. Um, so this, by the way, is a lemma from Zhang's paper. Um, and, it was, uh, and in some other situations, you need to control um, multidimensional exponential sums. So, so here, for example, is a more complicated sum of uh, over three variables, also from Zhang's paper. Um, but there's some, there's some non-trivial estimate on this thing. Uh, and here, you, um, the only way we know how to get good estimates on these multidimensional sums is to use the, the deep theory of, of Deline on the Riemann hypothesis uh, on uh, varieties or sheaves, uh, as used, for instance, by Birch and Bombieri. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so basically, the tools used for, for, for Zhang's method after these decompositions are, are Cauchy-Schwartz, uh, Fourier analysis, and then these exponential sum estimates. Okay, um, so, uh, so we managed to, opt to optimize um, a lot of, of all of, of these um, in, in components, we, we couldn't improve the Heath-Brown identity. This was optimal, but everything else had had some room for improvement. Um, so, for example, we found different ways to slice. Like the, the, the Cauchy-Schwartz is a very, very flexible tool. You know, if you have like five sums, you can split the sum in, in you know like five factorial different ways, and you can find different ways to Cauchy-Schwartz. And we tried many, many things. And and uh, and there's a lot of ways to 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 do it more flexibly, especially if you uh, use the fact that that your, all your moduli are smooth. This actually gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, we found in the literature um, a better way to handle short exponential sums. So, um, 
Zhang's methods used uh, completion of sums, the, and the, the poly Vinogradov method, which was sufficient. Um, but there's a, um, once your modulus is smooth, there's this, uh, there's this um, more advanced method called the, the Q van der Kolpert method, uh, introduced by Graham and Ringrose, which gives you uh, somewhat better results. Um, we found that there were certain, um, well, so as I said, you, you get these sums over five, six parameters. Um, most of them look sort of un, um, unusable, and so you, you, just, you just use the triangle inequality, forget about the, uh, um, many of the sums, and you just focus on one or two dimensional sums. But we found ways to, some of the, some, some of the sums, of some of the parameters we could actually export averaging over. Not all of them, but some of them we could do. And there was a lot of numerical optimization, which uh, was sort of painful. Um, but uh, after a few months, we were able to improve uh, the gain. So um, uh, um, Zhang was able to get up 0 0.01, 0 0.001 of an improvement over, over one half for the level distribution. We could get that up to like 0 0.23, uh, 0 0.023. Um, that was the limit of our methods. Okay. Um, all right, so, that, um, oh, and there was this one very crucial input, which I should mention, um, coming from uh, um, another group which, who also joined Polymath, but and, and initially they started on their own blog and then sort of merged, joined forces with us. So uh, Emmanuel Kowalski, Philip Michel, Paul Nelson, and, uh, and Etienne Fouvry um, found a different way to handle uh, one of the sums that Zhang did, uh, these so-called type 3 sums, um, which are closely related to the uh, distribution estimates for, the, um, for D3, the third divisor function. Um, and so there, that, that was the deepest part of, of Zhang's work, where he used this estimate of Birch and Bombieri. Um, so um, Kowalski, Michel, Nelson, and Fouvry found a, a more efficient way to do that using um, a, a slight variant of the Birch Bombieri estimates, so something called correlation estimates for hyperclusive sums. Um, but uh, it was a much, it was much so, uh, shorter. It was like one, only one Cauchy Schwartz involved, um, and gave quite good estimates. In fact, it's, uh, so good that that, that those estimates. Um, would, um, so um, initially in Zhang's work, there was there were these two estimates, type one and type well, actually three estimates, type one, type two, and type three. And um, the exponent came from sort of a delicate optimization between one, two, and three. Um, but with what Kowalski did the, um, and, these, uh, and his co-authors, the, um, the type three estimates became so strong that actually it was just a competition between type one, type two, and um, a certain cutoff coming from the Heath finite identity. And th that, um, that basically um, there was... Um, um, uh, they were so strong that they were no longer um, the key factor in, in getting the best bounds. So um, that was a very important input. Um, and so that, so that got inserted into our machine. And so we got this little factory of different groups uh, lowering the, uh, the, uh, the best constant. Um, and you know, at, at times, basically, the, the, the constant was improving by, by the hour. So, so here uh, uh, we had on the, on the wiki page um, a list of world records. So this, this H is the bounded gap, gap between primes. So you know, on, on May 14th, uh, Jean got 70 million, and it, it started going down after that. Um, so for example, by June 24th, it was uh, 10,206. Um, and uh, yeah, it just kept going down. So sometimes uh, we made a mistake, and we had to cross out some of the, the things that we did. Uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's how progress made. Actually, yeah, so, so one of the secrets to making a good polymath project is that the, the people, participants, have to be willing to make mistakes in public. Uh, and to throw things out there, they get corrected, and then, and then progress happens. But uh, yeah, if, you just, if, you, if you hold things to yourself and don't show anyone until, you, you've, uh, until you're sure it's correct, it goes a lot slower. Yeah, but you know, at, at times it was like yeah, every hour or every few hours that the number was going down. Um, so it was quite exciting, actually. Um, very time-consuming, actually. But, um, all right, so um, eventually um, the gap went down, but, but eventually we sort of ran out of all the optimizations to find, and we, we eventually got a bound of 4,680. Um, so for example, here on 19th of July, I managed to, to work out uh, a, a, new, a new distribution estimate, um, starting from, um, as input, one of these estimates of the lean, and, and it took a while to actually check this, and then it feed it into the other machine, but, you know, but within about 10 days, uh, it was... Uh, um, we could we could put we could put all the ingredients together and we, we finally got this this bound of 4,680. Okay, um, yeah, and of course yeah, and, we, and it was checked and everything. Okay, so um, all right, so at that point we decided we'd, we we're done. Uh, we should write things up. Um, at that point we discovered that writing was actually quite difficult. Um, so you know, the, the these polymath projects they, they 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 run in sort of blocks. You know, we we, we take small steps at a time. Um, 
And so it doesn't look like you're doing you, we, uh, every every single step is sort of uh, fairly manageable. But when we, you know, there were like 17 blog posts, each one had like 100 comments. We put it all together. Actually, it was, it was a huge paper. Um, yeah, so we started uh, to actually write up the, uh, the result. Um, the first version of our write-up actually was 160 pages, <laughs> uh, which was a shock to us, actually, um, yeah, to actually put everything together. Um, but okay, so it took like, several months to actually write this thing up. Um, and, uh, and then we got, um, okay, so, but before we could finish, actually, we got overtaken by events. Um, so as we know now, um, so we started writing up in August and October and November. We were still writing. Um, and then in November, um, of course, um, Maynard gave this, this, uh, this amazing improvement. So we had stopped at 4,680, and Maynard found this much simpler method to get boundary gaps, which, which bypassed us to get 600. Um, and so, um, okay, so that actually immediately made half our paper obsolete. Um, the, the, other, um, the distribution estimates we had were still new, and so we eventually published half of that paper, which had the, the distribution estimates. Uh, but the stuff which gave the, the, uh, the 4,680, yeah, that's still online, but it's, it's, it's not published. Um, yeah, and we, we've seen, okay, maybe I'll, I'll skip what may not do, because we've seen it, you, just, you, you change the sieve, and you, you have to now optimize a certain multi-dimensional uh, variational problem rather than a one-dimensional variational problem. Um, okay, so maybe I'll skip that since uh, it's been discussed already. Um, okay, and you can get many, many progressions, uh, many primes in a tuple rather than just two. Okay, so, um, and so as, as James said, this, this, this new sieve is much more flexible. It has many, many further applications, and just, just one of them, which is, which, I, I, which is quite nice, is that uh, not only can you get small gaps between primes with, with this new uh, version of the GPY sieve, you can get large gaps as well. Okay. Um, all right, so after James um, had, this, uh, had this breakthrough, actually I had also worked out something similar at about the same time, but I, I ended up not publishing it, I put it on my blog instead. Um, that, um, um, so um, we decided to actually, uh, so because they use a different method than, 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 than the polymath method, the obvious thing to do was combine the two methods to, um, to make further progress, and so we started um, what we call polymath 8b. Uh, which, is, which was to, uh, to uh, in, incorporate Maynard's new ideas and, and get better bounds. Okay. Um, and so eventually what we realized, we tried many things, but the, um, eventually what we realized was that the, the most uh, optimal way to proceed was to actually uh, uh, improve, uh, to find better um, solutions to the variational problem, or to maybe modify the sobex sieve so that you can um, give more flexibility to, to, the, uh, to, to enlarge the... Um, uh, the domain in which you're doing your, your optimization. So we started optimizing um, uh, this, this, this variation problem numerically. Um, and so, yes, this, uh, um, so now actually James Maynard and, and Pace Newson actually started taking the lead and doing a lot of computations. Um, and in fact, um, uh, we, um, uh, we actually got some other people interested. So uh, we, we, there was a numerical analyst at Ghent actually, who was not a number theorist. Um, but he was an expert in, 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 in precisely optimizing quad, big quad, quadratic programs. And so he actually ended up um, giving a, an extremely efficient um, way to compute the, uh, these, these, um, these, uh, these variational problems based on something called the, the creel of subspace method. Um, and using these sort of things, we could get actually the boundary gaps already down to about 270. Um, okay. Um, then there were some other tricks we, we used. Um, so the Solberg sieve, we found some... some some slight ways to, 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 um, to push. So we, there's this level distribution R, uh, which, is, uh, which, is given to, which is given to you by how much distribution um, you have. And your Sobek sieve can't go beyond R most of the time. Uh, but we, we found ways to sort of, you can put a little portion of the Sobek sieve up, uh, above R as long as not too much of it is above R. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of tricks that you can you do to sort of um, temporarily borrow some room above, uh, above the level distribution. And one of the most basic ones, actually, was something that uh, was already showed up in, in Dan's talk. Uh, so there's this very simple trick that, you know, the Sobek sieve, um, let, um, so, so very often you need to lower bound an expression like this. So a, a sum of squares, basically, an plus bn squared. Um, and maybe an uh, an sits below level r, but bn sits above level r. And so when you expand this out, um, bn times bn is going to be something bad, because this will give you something above r squared. And, uh, and maybe you don't have the estimates for this. But, uh, but b squared is positive, so you can actually just throw it away. And you can, you can lower bound 
something like a inverse b in squared by just uh, two of the three terms in the square, and you just throw away the, the third one being positive. Um, and, um, and you know that, that looks like you're throwing away something, but it, it turns out that the um, that the, the, uh, the additional flexibility that you get from allowing some of the um, sieve to poke above your, your level of distribution uh, can can overcome the loss um, of throwing away the square, and you actually get a bit of gain this way. Uh, not too much, but you get a little bit of a gain. Uh, and so, doing that, we were able to eventually get uh, 246. And this is this is now the world record. We we stopped uh, a few months ago. Um, I think well, partly well, exhaustion <laughs> for one reason, but but uh, um, we were reaching the limits of our methods. Um, the, the the final computation that got this was like a, a two-week computer optimization, um, and we could possibly get 242 if you ran a computer for a couple year, like a year or so. But yeah, well, at, that, at that point, it wasn't really we did consider it wasn't really worth it. Um, okay, so we got about a 246, and this is uh, going to appear in a week or so, actually, in the, in the, in the journal. Um, so that's, that's an unconditional result. We don't assume any hypotheses to get 246. Um, if you assume the um, Elliott Halperstam conjecture, which is a, a, the optimal level distribution, you can do better. Uh, so already GPI got about a 16. Uh, if you assume EH, may not boost to 12. Uh, so we were able to get this down to 6. So uh, if you assume uh, actually a generalization of the Elliott Halberstam conjecture, we can actually get gap solution primes at distance six apart. Um, and this was uh, actually quite a nasty um, optimization. Um, so previous optimizations were over polynomial functions. It turns out that for various technical reasons, you have to use piecewise polynomials. And so you have to decompose a certain simplex into or actually a certain polytope into, 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 into subpolytopes and have different polynomials on, on each piece to optimize. Here's eventually the, the, the optimizer that we actually found. Um, once you actually find the optimizer, actually checking that it works is not so difficult, but, but finding this was not easy. Um, and, uh, okay. Um, yeah, so, um, so you, can, you can get prime gaps of distance at most six, uh, but unfortunately due to this parity problem, which has already been mentioned in previous talks, uh, six is the limit of our method. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's no way that any of these SIF theoretic methods, even with the best distribution estimates, can get uh, uh, a prime gap five or less, unfortunately. Um, but you can, you, but you, you can get six. Uh, so basically, um, you can find triples, like n in plus two and plus six, where you can find infinitely many triples where two numbers are prime. Um, so um, so th that's the limit of our methods. Um, there is one amusing consequence, which, which is, well, that's kind of silly, but I, I, I quite like it. Um, so a, a variant of this prime gap six result is the following. Um, so suppose you assume this elliott halberstam conjecture, or the generalized elliott halberstam conjecture, which is the, the best possible um, distribution estimate you could hope for, then um, we can't prove the twin prime conjecture from that. Right? Bombieri already showed that the, the parity problem uh, blocks you. Um, and we also can't prove the go-back conjecture. Go-back conjecture is every even number is some of two primes. Uh, so we can't prove either of those. But amusingly, you can prove one of the two in some sense. That, um, that if you assume this, that the, this conjecture is true, then either there are infinitely many twin primes, or the go-back conjecture is almost true, in the sense that every large odd number, every large even number is uh, within two of the sum of two primes. Okay, so, um, so you, you can almost do go back or you can do twin prime, but I, I can't tell you which one um, if, uh, if, if you assume there's a strong distribution result. It's kind of an amusing uh, 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 corollary of our methods. Um, uh, but, uh, okay. uh, basically, what, what you do is that you find three numbers, two of which are twins, and, and, and then the third one plus the, the, the first one sums up to to a fixed large even number, and two of them are prime, and so you get, you get one, of, one of the two of these to, to happen. Okay. Yeah, so uh, in the end, we had these projects, polygraph 8, polygraph 8b. Um, so combined, they ran for about a year. We had 37 blog posts with dozens of mathematicians um, uh, contributing, uh, sort of a thousand comments, which are all online, and they, they came from, you know, mostly number theory, but, but, but there were important contributions from numerical analysts and, and, and many other uh, mathematicians, also some amateurs, uh, made a lot of, of important contributions. Uh, we have three papers now, um, two are accepted for publication, um, and we've, uh, yeah, we, we improved the distribution estimates of, of Zhang, and so hopefully these distribution estimates will be useful for other things. Um, we found some new ways to tweak the Selberg sieve, uh, going a little bit beyond what, what GP1 and Maynard did. And of course, we have the best numerical bounds on bounding gastrin primes. So that's, that's, uh, that's what we accomplished. Um, so not every polymath project has been successful. You know, some, some have fizzled out. You know, some problems were just not appropriate for a polymath format. Um, I think what helped 
this particular project works so well is there's a couple of factors. Um, one is that uh, there was a lot of interest in, in the problem. So, so people naturally volunteered their time and, and contributed some very important um, uh, pieces of mathematics uh, to, 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 or even just asking the right questions and, and, uh, um, and, or even just giving a pep talk, you know, just sort of encouraging, uh, sort of, uh, you know, like, like all our comments, you have these little upvotes and downvotes you know, on each comment. And, like, so, you know, you, 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 you make some progress and you get like, like you know, 10 upvotes and so forth, you get 10 thumbs up. Uh, it, it, it is a kind of a, a nice incentive. Um, what was also nice was that the problem was, was very modular, that you could split into different groups and each group could work separately. I mean, they, they, they of course, followed what everyone else was doing. But um, this allowed for a much broader uh, participation than what would uh, than in, in uh, yeah, if, it were, if, if it was a more technical project where you needed to understand many, many fields of mathematics before you can get started, we would not have had so much, such a participation. Um, one nice thing was that we had a great way to keep score, um, which was this H, and just kept going down. Um, and uh, yeah, most projects, you know, you, you succeed or you fail. It's, it's, it's much harder to measure partial progress. Or if, if there's partial progress, it's, it's, it's in a very technical sense, which is hard to appreciate by most people. But this H is something that, that, that many people can appreciate. Um, and a point which actually Ben Green was fond of making, it was a decreasing natural number. And we know from the world ordering principle that it has to stop. Um, so this is also a good thing. You know, if it was a real number that was going down, you know, we might never finish. Uh, but you know, somehow with a natural number, it's so guaranteed that, that we have to stop. Um, and people just contributed a lot of time and effort um, to, and, and, and to discuss things very openly. It, it, was, a, it was a very pleasant um, experience, actually. Um, you know, everyone was very encouraging. It was, it was not competitive um, at all. Well, I mean, we, we competed sort of in, in a friendly way. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there was a lot of participants, so A, a and AB both had, had quite a few uh, people uh, participating. Okay, so thank you very much. That's our story. Any comments or questions? Um, did you consider the, uh, the possibility to put all participants' uh, names on the article, like the physicists do in CERN? Ah, yes, yes, yes. So, um, in the very first Polymath project, uh, we discussed this, this issue. Um, and it was decided um, by consensus that the, um, the most um, fair thing would, was to make a, make a, a, a pseudonym. And so the, uh, the, the first project was on something called the, the density hells jewett conjecture. So the pseudonym was DHJ Polymath. Um, and so the paper appeared with that, with that one um, pseudonym. And uh, in the paper, there was, there was a link to the wiki page where the, the, the participants were listed. And um, the way we decided to list participation, because, you know, um, it was hard to draw the line. Like there were many people who just contribute one comment out of a thousand, and do you do you put that on, on, on the list? And so what we did was we, did, we just had a voluntary sign up sheet. So there was there was this, this wiki page, and if if you felt that you were a contributor, you would just sign your, your name. And so these are the people who actually um, felt that they contributed enough to be listed as, as participants. Um, and so since then we have used DHG Polymath as our pseudonym. Um, Although there was one journal which didn't accept that. They, they, they wanted us to use our real names. Um, but, but most of the papers, uh, they were happy to, to take a pseudonym. Um, one slight downside of this, as I found out, is that you can't use the polymath publications um, uh, in, in, your, in your CV um, for purposes, because you're not explicitly an author. And so the, the, the bureaucrats higher up sometimes don't like that. So you have to list this as sort of external activities or something rather than, than actual publication. Yeah, so you, know, you shouldn't rely on polymath as your sole source of publications, is what I'm saying. Right? But, uh, um, yeah, so, but if, as long as you have other things uh, going on in your, in your CV, this, this should not be a problem. Because yeah, in CERN, they list everybody who has been working, even a technician and so on. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's a difficult. But it's a long time. list of names. It's longer than the article. Yeah. No, we, um, yeah, we decided not to go down that route. Yeah. Any? Yeah. So this uh, workflow is very interesting and certainly very new. Uh, I was wondering, with all those little improvements, do you, how do you manage errors? Do you, I know some numerical results are easily automatically verifiable, but this is not the case for all the arguments. So 
do you check each of those small steps by yourself or do errors usually get caught by the community on their own or did you even manage to find retrospectively uh, an error in one of the arguments when you published the paper when you wrote the paper right so um yeah, so, so, so it was mostly the community checking. Um, so especially if there was an improvement that improved the headline bound. Then, um, yeah, so we had a special not notation. We put a question mark on, on, on a bound if it was not confirmed. Um, and then so there was a, a big incentive for someone else to, to independently confirm the same results. Um, we were fortunate that, that most of the computations we had, um, um, they may have taken time to produce um, of, um, like a, a set of values, which of, uh, like, a, for example, a function which optimizes a certain functional. But once someone found the, um, the optimizer, the checking it was a lot simpler than, than actually finding it. Um, so it was actually relatively easy to check these arguments. Um, we had this lengthy, when we were writing the paper, we had this lengthy proofreading um, uh, phrase uh, where different people volunteered to read through section 10, section 11, and so forth. And we did find a lot of typos. Um, and a few moderately, moderately serious mathematical issues, but fortunately, um, nothing truly uh, um, uh, serious. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker.